Good evening, everybody. This is Daryl. Um, how are you guys doing today? I'm going to I'm gonna open all the mics just for a minute. Just let you all talk if you want. Anybody want to say hello? Hey, what's up, Hello. Hello, everybody. Anybody hello. Have, any anybody, uh, have anything they want to ask or uh, talk about? Uh, no. Is our screen supposed to show this right now? It says launching. What says launching? On the screen, on my screen, it says uh, there's there's no like. You don't you don't see uh, the word creative presentation week two. No, I I was, but it, it switched to this other thing, and now it says launching and three dots next to it. Uh, it may come back. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, quit and, and and join again. That sometimes does a reset for folks. Okay. Uh. Uh, we shouldn't have any bandwidth problems without too many people here. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the tech a little low today so we won't have any problems. I'm still getting used to the new Zoom system. How are you guys dealing with uh, all the craziness in the world? Uh, life under quarantine. Is it changing stressful. any of your uh, lifestyles? Definitely stressful. Definitely stressful. Yeah, definitely stressful. I still go to work, actually. Um, Are you an essential worker? Yeah. Yeah, he's essential. But uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's different though, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, and as you know, I'm recording this, so um, uh, I'm gonna turn off all the mics now and uh, launch this. So here we are in week two. Uh, I was able to get everybody's um, TED Talks papers graded. If you turned it in last night, uh, I was able to get it graded and back to you, and I was pretty pleased. Most of you did a really good job. Uh, I think this is a pretty good sharp class. I think you understand how to follow instructions and you can you know, express yourself well. Uh, those of you that hadn't finished it, I went ahead and lengthened the extension give you extra time. There's no reason not to. And uh, another thing I wanted to mention, uh, it's a bit of an oddity of the schedule. You know, one of our, uh, one of the things we're supposed to do here in the first month is get used to how quick and intense everything is, but occasionally the schedule changes somewhat. And uh, one of the things that's happening this month in the month of April is that there's a week set out for spring break. Now, um, it's actually superfluous, it was always kind of superfluous for online students. It's really meant for the campus students. And here at Full Sail, we've shut down the campus and sent all the on campus students to being online students. So um, I'm not sure we should have had a spring break at all, but it's in the schedule. And that's coming up next week. So the way that it affects you guys is that we're gonna have a normal schedule of uh, week two assignments. It opened up this today. I want you to make a plan. But instead of being due on this Sunday, it's all due on the following Sunday. You're actually going to get two weeks to get this week's assignments done. And that's probably helpful for you because uh, there's a lot to do this week. And, uh, you know, having a little bit of extra time should be very helpful. And I'll be around all next week. I'm not really taking any time off or anything. So um, I'll be talking to you about that. I don't know that we will, I'll probably have another live presentation even though it won't be a full lecture. But uh, when, what we're doing this week is we're starting to plan our main presentation. So I'm gonna talk to you today about that. I'm gonna get us all started in the right direction. And for those of you that don't wanna wait a really long time, if you finish your plan before two weeks, you can go ahead and turn it into me and ask me to go ahead and grade it and I'll give you feedback. And if I say that you're on the right track, you can go ahead and get started on making the actual presentation. So basically this week is the planning phase of making your main presentation for the month. And whatever you plan this week, you're supposed to create the following week. And so as soon as your plan is uh, run by me and it looks good, I can give you uh, leave to go ahead and start working on the main thing. That would actually give you a little bit extra time to work on the, the, the presentation itself rather than uh, just wasting an extra week. 
So uh, we'll try to make the best of the timing, but I wanted to let all of you know that in fact, there is sort of an extra week built into this week's activities. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see that reflected in the schedule. Um, so what are we doing this week? Well, we're, we're, we're doing some reading from the other book. Uh, last week we read from uh, Resonate. This week we're reading from the book Slideology. And uh, some of the chapters that we're reading, one is called The Five Theses to the Power of Presentation. It was really Nancy Duarte's first effort to figure out what presentations are good for, what, are, what, you, what should you use them you know, to, to accomplish. And uh, some of the things we've already heard about, you know, she, she has some uh, really strong ideas that she repeats in a lot of different ways. The first one you know, which is that the audience is the king, is the hero, that presentations are meant to be specific. You don't do a to whom it may concern type of presentation. You have in mind whom you're talking to and you research that audience so that you know how to reach them, how to connect with them, what jokes they're gonna like, what references they're gonna like, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what language and, ma and manner of speaking will best move that particular audience. So this is research that you need to do in the beginning. So this week we're just figuring out how do you start a presentation? Well, you do some planning, you do preparation work. So rather than start with the slides, which we say is the last thing you're supposed to do, we want you to start with thinking about the aspects of the presentation that you need to have answers for before you can even start. And one is, who am I speaking to and what am I trying to, to get them to do? You know, what do I need to know about my audience in order to persuade them? What kind of uh, research do I need to know ahead of time so that I've worked that out. This is all part of the planning phase. So that's what we're working on thinking about today. That's what the reading is gonna be about. Another aspect of the five theses, uh, presentations are meant to be viral. They're meant to move people and spread ideas. So you can have a very uh, um, uh, strong notion. And if you get it in a short clarifying uh, model in a presentation, you can show that to a lot of people and you can spread it around really fast. Rather than being a presentation that takes a long time to get through, the best presentations are short and to the point. And if they are you know, about great ideas and they're really short and punchy, they're the kind of thing that people are gonna seek out. They're the kinds of things that end up going viral. They really help you to spread ideas. Uh, they're meant to be visual. Uh, that's why they're presentations. They, they could be speeches by themselves. You know, the human voice is a great way to carry information. But when you combine that with media, when you combine that with multimedia, it becomes even more powerful. That's the drama that helps people remember the story. So uh, help them see what you're saying. You want to spend some energy and, and time on the slides so that you've got some, some great visuals there. You've got some you know, great uses of, of text, um, great uh, video is great. So anything that you can put on the slides that help us understand what you're saying will help the audience uh, have a greater impact to the words that you're saying. It's practice design, not decoration. We're filling these slides up, not just to fill them up. They're not just to be pretty pictures that are on the screen while we talk. They are additional communication, they're additional information that helps us understand what you're saying. And then think about the relationships that are going on. If you were presenting this live and you were standing in front of an audience, you would be able to get cues from that audience. So there's a relationship between the speaker and the audience. And uh, if the audience was sitting there listless, maybe you'd know to add a little more energy into what you were saying. Or they were looking to be, if they sounded a little confused, Maybe you might start slowing down and explaining what you're doing more because you can actually get feedback from the vibe in the room as a, a live speaker as to how well you're doing. You can read the audience, so to speak. So that's a relationship that happens. Uh, when you're making an online presentation like we are, where you're not really there in person, uh, the main relationship that happens is between the soundtrack, the voiceover, and the slides. And you wanna make sure that you know the, the slides are in sync, 
that the slides are relevant to the voice, that there is a sort of conversation going on between what the audience is hearing and what they're seeing. And those are the kinds of relationships you want to think about, you want to plan out, you want to have some um, input into it before you actually create the presentation. And these are all things that you have to, to like bring into the planning so that the presentation itself comes off the way you want it. So one of the things Nancy Duarte writes about in uh, this, the reading we've assigned you this week is uh, talking about the presentation ecosystem. We have a lot of people here who are going to study filmmaking. And the filmmaking uh, process is one that's really well known to most people, even if you're not a filmmaker, you, you probably understand that in the traditional Hollywood filmmaking, we have pre-production, production, and post-production. And pre-production can go on a long time because it, it's relatively inexpensive, but you want to do all the planning that will keep the cost down. So in pre-production, you do things like uh, write the script and hire the actors, hire the crew, build the sets, uh, plan out all these things. So you spend as much time in pre-production as you need so that production goes very efficiently. And uh, one of the elements of filmmaking is that it's a very expensive process. So when you're actually shooting the film, you wanna make that happen as efficiently and, and quickly as possible. The production um, aspect of filmmaking is meant to be tightly uh, planned and, and you know, with um, a production schedule and making maximum use of everyone's time. And so that's what all the planning goes into at a time. So that everything's ready, all the resources line up, and you're not spending an awful long time in production. And uh, in the old days, before film went digital, it was even a little more difficult because you would shoot chemical film one day and you'd have to process it overnight and look at it the next day to know whether or not you got all the shots you needed. And so people would have to spend their time in each production day looking at dailies to make sure that the, the previous day's shooting didn't need to be corrected. So again, very time consuming, very, uh, very tight on the time process. And then once all the shooting is done, you can let all the actors go, you can let all the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, production people go, and you just get into editing the film. And uh, you can uh, take a little more time with that, but editing is where you assemble everything, you put the film in order, you add soundtracks and sound effects, and you probably uh, work up marketing plans and other things. Uh, all of that can probably be part of the pre-production schedule as well. But post-production is assembling the film together. Now, the modern filmmaking process, this is a little bit confusing because everything happens in the same place. Uh, whereas these were th three very distinct processes in the old days, nowadays everything takes place on your computer. So you're gonna write the script on your computer, you're going to uh, uh, design all the models and do all the pre-production work on your computer. Uh, and then when you actually shoot it, you're shooting it digitally. Probably uh, you may use a camera with uh, an external source on it, but, the, but the, uh, the film itself is probably gonna get dumped on the computer because in post-production, it's gonna be edited on the computer as well. And what that changes for the filmmaking process is that it's all not necessarily broken up anymore. You, you might be shooting some stuff way ahead of finishing the script just to know that you have certain portions of it, et cetera. So you, don't, you work in a slightly more nonlinear fashion. But those, those distinctions matter. Everyone who goes and studies filmmaking, they understand that in order to make a film, you follow this process generally, pre-production, production, post-production. Post and um, creating a creative presentation is pretty much the same way. Nancy Duarte writes about it and she's broken it up into three different legs and I wanna spend some time talking about that. Uh, instead of the, the three that we talk about for film, her tracks are the message track, the visual story track, and the delivery track. Each one of these is separate and they all have component parts. So I wanna take a little bit of time and talk about the component parts because I think it's gonna matter. And learning this process is very valuable for you to, to start making creative presentations the right way. Like I said last week, 
the thing you want to get out of the habit of doing is doing presentations the wrong way. Opening PowerPoint first and starting to make slides and then figuring out what it is you want to say. That's going backwards. So we want to do this in the right order. And that means following this process. And I'm going to take you through it very quickly. If you can kind of turn this into a chronological process in your head, I think that it's going to end up being uh, a very valuable way for you to make presentations and keep making them better and keep um, trying new things and improving each time. So uh, starting with the message track, again, we've already heard this, but it always bears repeating. The very first thing to figure out is who's the audience? Who are you speaking to? It governs what you have to say. It governs how you're going to say it. It governs the level of language. It governs the choices of art. It governs uh, the references. If you know who you're talking to, then you know how to talk to them and you know what you want to persuade them to do. And, uh, you know, so uh, part of your job in pre-production is doing research on your audience to know the, the questions about them that you need to have answered so that you can make the best presentation that you can make. Ideation. Now, this is a very important part. It's probably a word you never heard of before. It's a simple word, and uh, it's a sister to a word that I'm sure you've heard of, creation. You know that creation is the act of creating things, and ideation is the act of generating ideas. And this is a very, very, very important part of every creative process. And the only reason that this word is not more well known is that there is a metaphor for it that we've all taken to using, and we don't even think about it anymore, but that's Brainstorming. Now, brainstorming is a combination of words that doesn't really make any sense, doesn't mean anything. It sort of presumes that there's some kind of uh, meteorological uh, um, environment in your head and that you're causing a storm. But a brainstorm means that you're activating the back of your head, you're generating ideas. And uh, that's what ide ideation is about. And this is a kind of a mysterious process for us because we're pulling things from the back of our head Then, as creative artists, we don't really know what's making these associations happen. But everybody has a kind of creative, musing, brainstorming process that they go through. And as artists, I can tell you that the, the one thing that I can tell you that you can always apply is that Whatever amount of brainstorming you do now, if you increase it just a little bit, it'll make you a better artist. Most people are a little bit lazy. Most people stop too soon. And if you just keep at it, uh, now there's, a, there's a, a point of diminishing returns. You can't just brainstorm for years. Um, but if normally your idea is to think about something for six or eight minutes and stop then maybe try to go 10 or 12 minutes or 15 minutes and stop. Because ideation has a particular function and it has a particular way of working. And you generate a number of ideas and only lazy people take the very first ideas. You wanna generate a lot of ideas. Now, there's a certain point in which we all know we've sort of exhausted the well, but most people stop too soon. If you generate ideas a little bit longer than you think is necessary or comfortable, the chances are that the really interesting, the really usable, the really viable idea will come to you. And uh, one of the ways that we make that happen is we think about really crazy ideas, something that's unusable. Uh, you know, at this point, we use the term outside the box thinking because if you come up with something that is um, really out of the parameters of what you're normally thinking, it sort of shakes something loose in the back of your head. And the tendency is that the ideas that come forth after that crazy idea are actually more refined and more usable because it just sort of 
breaks up a log jam or something, continue different metaphors. But ideation actually is brainstorming and everyone has to go through a brainstorming process. And I want everyone to go through a brainstorming process this week in regards to planning out your presentation. So I'm gonna tell, we're gonna talk a little bit later about what the main topic is so that our presentation is going to be. And the assignment this week, the plan that you're turning in is this set of ideas that you generate. Meaning there's probably more in this plan than there's gonna be in your actual presentation because you wanna generate a lot of ideas, some of which you don't use. If you don't generate enough ideas, then you're, you don't have enough to go, go far enough. But if you generate more than enough ideas, then you have the luxury of picking and choosing the best ones. So this is an actual important and cru uh, crucial phase in every creative uh, presentation you might wanna to put together. And once you've generated all these no different ideas, these different thoughts about what could be in the presentation, you have to start to edit them down. You go through a process of writing and writing is hand in hand with editing, meaning that you're selecting the good ideas, you're embellishing ideas, you're maybe merging two thoughts together. You're figuring out how to put all this information together and tell a story. That's what we're doing after all, we're telling a story with the information that we have to, to tell. And um, it's always a good idea to turn this writing into a script. If we're going to be speaking out loud, the best way to do that is to create a script for ourselves. One that we can rehearse, that we can come familiar with, that we can uh, rely on. There are a number of advantages to writing a script. One is that it's a way of controlling the timing. The assignment that I'm going to give you guys for uh, the rest of the month, you have to write a present, you have to create a presentation that's three to four minutes long. So how do you control for that timing? How do you actually start out and work that out? Well, one of the ways you can do it is by uh, the amount of writing that you do. We've discovered that a, a single page double space, if you speak it out loud, is about a minute worth of time. So if I'm asking you to make something that's three to four minutes long, then I'm also asking you to write a script that's three to four minutes, double spaced, three to four pages, double spaced. Uh, the amount of writing on the page can help you to control the timing of what you need to do. And if later on someone asks you to create an eight minute presentation, you'll know that that's eight minutes of, uh, eight pages of uh, uh, writing double spaced. So the writing phase helps you to get your words in order, and then you wanna record that and uh, get that onto the soundtrack. Uh, you, there are a number of things to think about in writing, and we're gonna talk about story, uh, storytelling this week and next week, uh, and, and we're gonna play about with different forms, different ways to tell stories. But that's really the most important part of creative presentation. Putting your ideas together, and figuring out how to combine it to tell a story that makes sense and is compelling to the audience that you have to talk to. The second track is the visual track. So once you've figured out what you have to say and you've created that as a script and uh, for our purposes, instead of uh, rehearsing it so that you can speak it out live, you're gonna actually record that to audio. And so we'll be dealing with that aspect of uh, the tech as well. Uh, but um, even recording to audio, it's really great to have a script because it's something that you can rehearse and always uh, come back on and rely on. But the visual story is about the other dramatic multimedia uh, part of it that goes along with the voiceover. And here again, we want to do brainstorming. We want to generate ideas. There are a number of ways to do that. Some people sketch in a notebook. Some people who are online use different tools. A really great tool for collecting images and, and uh, colors and, and fonts and, and uh, ideas and whatnot uh, is a tool like Pinterest, where you can uh, pull images from different websites in together into certain collections of your own. So Pinterest is a great way to um, just collect images as you're surfing uh, and, and not necessarily working on this project, but any old project. 
you know, let's say that uh, you, you're very interested in images of, of, of computers. Well, you might have a Pinterest uh, collection of, of computer images. And every time you find a cool one, you can just dump it in there. And then later on, when you have to make a presentation, you want to find, you know, images of cool images of computers or old sci-fi type images. You will have already collected those because that would just be a natural process of what you're doing. So um, visual expression of your ideas is something you want to uh, figure out. And again, it's going to go back to knowing who you're talking to because the visual style that you want to incur is not only an expression of who you are, but it's who you're talking to. What do you want to impress? What do you want them to think? What, uh, what do you want them to think about you? And uh, lots of these things are uh, uh, involved in figuring out how to express yourself. What, are the image, what is the imagery that is going to speak to your own sophistication? It's going to speak to the audience that you're looking to. You know, if, if, we're, if, we're, uh, if our audience is people who are higher up in the industry and we want to impress them and they obviously have a higher developed sense of uh, visual design, we want to bring our A game. We want to give them images that are really going to wow and stun them. So that takes some planning. It takes some presentation. It takes some thinking about how do you want to express yourself? What are the images and ideas that you want to use? Uh, another aspect of visual thinking is figuring out how to create models. Uh, charts and graphs are useful sometimes, but uh, lots of times in a presentation, you're talking about ideas, you're creating models for ways of thinking about information. And that's a very difficult thing. A lot of times people have trouble figuring out how to think about uh, a relationship between you know, different pieces of information. And if you can create that model, if you can create uh, visual understandings that allow people to quickly understand, you know, the relationship between um, sales in Toledo and, and uh, whether or not you should, you know, uh, use one design over the other, that's going to be very valuable because not a lot of people have the ability to interpret uh, models for other people and if that's uh, if you're a conceptual thinker like that it's a very important skill you'll be engaged for life doing that um, one aspect of creating great slides is to have a sense of graphic design that's not to say that you're all have to be graphic designers but know that all of us in the modern age have been fed images uh, for our whole lives. So we are walking repositories of other people's expressions. And it's very easy just to think about what is the graphic design that, that uh, exists in the world and works. And uh, another thing to think about with graphic design, we're making slides that, that go by. They're not gonna hang on the screen forever. We want our slides not only to be on the screen for, you know, five to 10 seconds. You don't want any slide to hold longer than 20 seconds. So that means that the imagery that you put on those slides needs to be able to be interpreted and understood fairly quickly. You don't want to have very complex images. You don't want to have uh, very intricate um, photo collages. If you have a lot of images, you can do them over several slides, but you don't want to have one complex image that you hang on to for a minute, a minute and a half. You want to have multiple slides that go by that keeps the pace going for the media in the storytelling. And so part of what you want to do is use your own knowledge of all the signage that you've seen in the world in order to make things happen very quickly. You know, one thing to think about is um, signage on the highway. You know, we all go down the highway pretty fast, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. And there's often information that we need that's crucial, that's on these signs on the side of the road going by as we driving by at 70 or 80 miles an hour. That means those signs can't be overly complicated. If we need to know that it's uh, you know half a mile to the next exit, uh, that's got to be very clear information. And so graphic designers are very good at making 
clean statements, at using fonts that are easily read, and having contrast between the, uh, the font color and the background and not overlapping things. You know, uh, one of the mistakes I see lots of students make all the time is to have complicated photograph and then have uh, some text over top of it that doesn't have any contrast, that, that can't, can't hardly be read above the photograph. Uh, you're just causing trouble for yourself. Uh, and it's just very easy to separate those out. You can use the very same photograph and the very same sentence, but maybe put a graphic plate behind the, the text, just like there's a circle plate here behind this graphic design. If I use this black text on graphic design and I didn't have this black circle here, could you even read it because it's on a black background? So you have to think about those things and think about, you know, how can I create something that's so readable that people can instantly get what it is. And graphic design gives us a way of thinking about that. Graphic design also can, helps us to keep images clean and separated. You know, students want to uh, uh, make photo collages all the time. Uh, and, and that is not helpful for slide design. It can be useful to other places. If you're creating a single image that's gonna last, if you're creating a, uh, um, um, a sign on the side of the road that stays forever, maybe that can be complicated. But if you're creating something that people are only gonna look at for so many seconds, you wanna make sure that all the elements are separated out and you're not confusing people as they're trying to decipher what it means. Because at the same time they're looking at the new image, they're still listening to the voiceover and they need to make sure, you need to make sure that the imagery that you bring in doesn't take people off track from listening to the voiceover. Motion design, and there's a huge part of uh, presentations. Now, when I say motion design and people think about PowerPoint, you probably think of those 10 gazillion transitions that PowerPoint ships with. You know, the explosions and the, the curtains waving and uh, the water rippling and all these other things. None of those are anything I'm talking about because those are transitions between slides and they're really irrelevant. They're, they're ways of separating you from your other content. You're the, one, you're the person who makes the slides and, and that's what people are looking for. So what happens between the slides doesn't matter. You can really just do cuts and, and slides and dissolves. Those are the simplest things you can do between, to go from slide to slide and it makes sense. Well, there is motion design that helps to keep people in the moment. For instance, um, if you have a list of items, uh, you might want to put uh, them on the screen but instead of putting them all together at the same time where people might start to read ahead or whatever, you can bring those items on one at a time along with the voice because you have control over the sync. And in using simple motion design like that, you can build up a, you know, a five or six uh, item uh, bullet point list that doesn't allow people to read ahead, but actually just collects that information together before it moves on to the next slide. And simple motion design like that is very important for keeping people in the moment. That's one of the things you want to do with the sync. Um, so motion design, keep it simple, but use it as transitional material from slide to slide or within information in the same slide. The last track of the three legs of a presentation is delivery. To think about what are the circumstances that people get this in. And again, um, one of the things we were dealing with last week was just trying to broaden everyone's mind about what we meant about a presentation. You know, when we, when we uh, put our initial posts in the discussion boards, most people talked about the, the, the presentations you gave at school or in the army or someplace like that, some institution that you were already in. And then we looked at a bunch of TED Talks and that changed a different context. Suddenly we were in professional arenas, but it was a person on a stage speaking to people in theater seats. And those are very traditional types of presentations. But what I want you guys to be thinking about is that a presentation can be almost anything. And that for the most part, 
uh, nowadays because media is so prevalent. We're talking about creating movies. We're talking about creating elements for YouTube videos. So the element of delivery, how the end user receives your presentation is an entire thing that you have to design and, and play out. You can't leave that to chance. You, from the beginning, have to know what's going on. So the first thing to figure out is what is the human contact? Are you there in person? Are you delivering this presentation? Are you the speaker in front of live bodies? That carries with it uh, more responsibility that we're taking on this month for ourselves. But you have to stand there. You're, you're going to be responsible for uh, you know, what you're wearing, how you're standing, how you interact with people, uh, how you use your hands, your, your eye contact, your facial gestures. All these matter. Now, in, in our presentation, in creating an online presentation, the only thing we're going to concentrate on is the voice. We want to make sure that um, everyone uses their voice as their human element to connect with the other audiences. But uh, know that presentations incorporate the entire realm of a human-to-human -human contact. So. Do you have a live audience? Do you have a remote audience? Are you, are you performing in front of a television screen? So uh, a lot of us are gonna be able to turn on the video cam and that gives us again, the ability to use facial expressions, hand gestures, uh, lots of other aspects of the human uh, 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 condition, but all of us are gonna use our voice to connect with our audiences and that's, the part that represents you. You have to be there. And while it's a, a remote presentation, you are there in person, you're there represented by your voice. So what are the ways that people might receive a presentation? Well, they might look at it on a website, they might look at it on YouTube, they might look at it on their phone. You need to be thinking about not only methods of delivery, but conditions of viewing because maybe you're gonna create this presentation on your laptop and you have a, a 13 or 14 inch laptop and slides look great that way. But if you create something that you send out on YouTube and someone looks at it on their phone, now it's four inches. Does your, does your slide look the same uh, scale down to four inches as it did on your 14 inch laptop? Or maybe you go the other direction. Maybe you're sending it off to a TV and now it's on a, a, a 60 inch LCD or it's projected on the wall. Will your slides scale up? You don't want to discover the answer to these questions after the fact. You want to, in your planning, in your pre-planning, know that you have the right resolution to scale up or down, that you have the right design of your slides, that they can be, look, uh, they can be read easily uh, as, as small slides or, or scale up and look good as, as large slides. You want to think about what are the conditions that the audience is going to view your presentation under. And uh, part of it is going to be um, how are they going to hear it? Sometimes, you know, if, if people are looking at things on their phones, maybe they're just on headphones in, in the subway, or maybe they're not even on headphones and they're in the subway. Uh, is your audio going to be loud and clear enough? And you want to think about what are some future devices that might be coming. You know, we're about to move into new technology. Uh, VR and AR are going to be big deals. You know, you maybe most of the presentations you're going to create for the rest of your life are actually going to be taking place in uh, uh, VR space. Uh, and, and that requires a different kind of resolution. Uh, maybe you're going to be uh, working with interactive monitors or, or, or different technology that's coming up. You're not responsible for the way the world changes, but as a graphic artist, or as, a, as an artist who creates presentations, you have to know that that technology is coming. You have to keep an eye on it, and you have to be able to say that you're planning ahead or you're thinking about what it takes in terms of the resolution of your images or the type of video that you're using or the type of audio that you're using so that your uh, elements can be future-proofed to some degree. Uh, you can't see 10 or 15 years down the road, 
but it's always possible to see one or two years down the road, you know what technology is coming. Uh, and finally, the last aspect of uh, delivery has a kind of a funny name. We used to call it paper. Now it's easier to call it leave behind. And in a digital world, paper doesn't make sense. But the idea is that if you were actually delivering a presentation in a live theater, and that presentation were up on the screen and it were running for any period of time, four minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, however long it went, at a certain point it would stop. And that presentation being a time mark would no longer be going on. And then the question would be, how do you continue that conversation? Now, I know a lot of you are going to think about in your presentations, putting your email address on your last slide or your, you know, your uh, Instagram uh, handle or something like that. Whatever your phone number, whatever you put on that last slide as, your, as a way that you think people can continue to connect with you, I guarantee you there isn't a single person in that audience that's gonna rip out their notebook and write it down and, and uh, take that information. If it's on the slide, people don't necessarily have access to it. They're just seeing it and it's gone. So once the presentation's over, how do you keep people in the conversation? Well, in the old days, you might, if you were a live presentation, you might design a special flyer or brochure, you know, with the same graphic design as the presentation, and you'd hand those out, or maybe you'd hand out your business cards. And that's how people would get your phone number. That's how people would be able to, to get back to you. If you're present, if you're presenting your, uh, if you're making your presentation on the web nowadays, or on a particular web page, or through some web service, if you're on YouTube, then it's going to be the Chrome around the presentation. What it, do you have a link there? Do you have an email link that they can get a hold of you? That, you know, if your presentation is successful and you get the audience to want to say yes, how can they tell you yes? And that's what the lead behind is about. So you have to you have to be responsible for thinking about. You know, what if I do persuade them? How do I get them to get a hold of me? And certainly, um, that's the entire point in something like a uh, um, uh, maker's documentary, where where people are, are, are do a demo and they and they want you to 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 invest in a product. Well, if if the uh, demonstration is successful, you know, right there next to it is the I contribute or I want to buy this link. And that's very, very important. It's, it's the way that people get to say yes. It's how the conversation has continued. And it's something that's a crucial to you thinking through in terms of making that persuasive argument uh, connect. So those are the uh, legs. I know I talked a little bit long about that, but if you can kind of understand that process and not necessarily go through every single phase of it each time, you're making a presentation, but realize that you need to say in your mind, have a checklist of, did I think about this? Did I think about this? Can I think about this? If you turned it into a checklist and you just ran it through your head before you, you um, uh, uh, stopped the PowerPoint slides, then I think you would always uh, be in a better position to know that you've, you've really uh, prepared for the presentation that you want to get to your audience. And at each point in this phase, that we've lined out here, there is the, the chance to, you know, self-reflect and say, did I get this right? Am I he heading in the right direction that I want to go in? And at each point you can, you can, you can self-correct and keep making it better. So I'm going to ask you to create a document this month, well, this week that represents your ideas for the presentation I want you to create. And for every one of you, I want you to go through a brainstorming phase. And there are actual rules or guidelines for brainstorming. So I want to show those now. I want to look at those now. So the rules for brainstorming. Very first rule, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. The whole point of brainstorming is that you just keep generating ideas. So in the same way that you don't want to be that guy that picks the very first image on a Google search, you don't want to be the guy that sits down to have a bunch of ideas, has one idea and stops. You don't have a clue whether that was your best idea or your worst idea. You don't have anything to compare it to. 
And that's just being lazy because this doesn't really take very long. But when you're in the moment, when you're in the creative mood of thinking through these ideas, that's the moment to strike. That's the moment to have a bunch of ideas, to brainstorm. Rule number two, encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. This is the point at which you haven't committed anything, uh, uh, committed to doing anything. Anything is possible. And with that, there's a certain wildness. There's a certain freedom that's available. And you can uh, um, take every idea to an extreme. And in doing so, you kind of free yourself and make sure that the other ideas that connect to it are better or more refined. Speaking of wild, crazy ideas encourages you to come up with better, cleaner ideas. Rule number three, quantity counts at this stage, not quantity. So, you know, if you normally get four or five ideas, push it, get six or eight ideas. If you normally have 10 ideas, go for 15. Whatever your process is, push it past what you normally do, and I guarantee it's gonna make you a better artist. Now these last two are not something that you guys are necessarily going to encounter this month as you're working alone. But when you get out into the working world and you're starting to work on a creative team, that teams brainstorm together. And these are rules for that. Rule number four, build on the ideas put forth by others. So if you're working at a creative company and there's sit and everyone in the company is sitting around working on a project, people will throw out ideas. Sometimes they will um, take something that someone else has said and reframe it or rephrase it or add to it. And that's part of brainstorming. And don't be afraid of that. Don't be pr proprietary about ideas. This is how groups trust each other. If you're on the same team, you can't be stealing from each other. You're just making each other better. So build on ideas put forth by others. And along with that, rule five, every idea and every person has equal worth. You may be the lowliest guy, the newest hired on your creative team, but if you're in a brainstorming session for the team and you have the best idea, that will circulate to the top. Uh, so there's a sort of um, egalitarian atmosphere to a team that is brainstorming together and there's really a, a great spirit and collegiality to it. People don't cling to their own ideas. They, they give everything they have to the group. And it really is um, uh, a great feeling to feel like you as a team came up with uh, the very best that you could do for yourselves. So I want you all to go through the brainstorming process in terms of working on this project. Now, so I haven't got to it. I haven't told you what the, the, the topic is yet. But before I get to the main assignment this week, which is the plan for your presentation, I want to get to uh, talking about the uh, discussion. This week's discussion is actually pretty amazing as well. It's uh, two really hot assignments for you to work on. So this is a great week for you to have uh, fun and be creative. So the idea for this discussion is how do you get inspired and what inspires you and how do you spread that passion? So people are inspired by different things. Some people like movies, some people like art, some people like books, some people like video games, some people like audio, some people like sports. So whatever it is that personally motivates you, you're gonna come across some piece of media that really swells up within you and creates a magic moment of uh, interest and, and, and uh, uh, intensity. And how do you translate that to other people? What are the tools we have for taking our internal passion and spreading them to other people? Well, really, the only thing we have is our voice. So this week's discussion board is an exercise in using your voice to transfer your passions to others. It's a little bit complicated. So um, 2.3 it's called emotional storytelling. Let me get out of the uh, discussion board here, or the, the slides here, and um, go to the website, and uh, we'll talk about it. We wanna go through this. So if I go to the instructions for emotional storytelling, 
Oh, and I hope I'm still online. Yeah. There we go. Uh, try that again. Okay. So here on emotional storytelling, we've got some instructions that we're setting up and we have a couple of videos that we want you to watch. So um, the first thing I want you to do is to watch these two videos. The first one is a TED talk. So some of you may have, have seen this. Uh, I think I don't think I noticed anybody turning Julian Treasure in this week. But uh, this is a TED Talk. I think you will all love it. Julian Treasure, how to speak so that people want to listen. So Julian Treasure is teaching us how to use our voice to be authentic. The notion is that some people, uh, you know, speak from the heart and you can tell. Some people... Uh, most people, you can know when they're lying, you know, why do we always make jokes about used car salesmen? Because used car salesmen tell you, oh, this car's hardly been used. It was driven by a little old lady on Sunday and you know they're lying. Most of us, when we're lying, you can tell it in our voice. And most of us, when we're speaking from the heart, when we're telling our authentic truths, you can tell it in our voice. And this is what Julian Treasure is talking to us about. So he identifies a concept that he calls HAIL, H-A-I-L. Stands for honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And when you're speaking the truth from your heart, other people can tell. Now that's not to say that there aren't some people who can fool us. There are great actors and actresses in the world and so forth. But most of us don't have the ability to lie very well that when, um, that if you are not speaking the truth, it kind of comes through in your voice. And if you are speaking the truth, there's something about the way that you speak that other people can recognize and it affects them. So you want to try to talk that way. You want to talk about an authentic experience that you've had. And you want to speak in a way that connects and moves with others. So the second uh, notion that he has in his uh, talk about using what he calls our vocal toolbox. We all, we all have little tools and techniques about using our voice that help us to talk to other people in special ways. And they're very simple things. It's not some great mystery. But uh, what can you do with your voice that, that you can change and makes difference, that makes sense? Well, you can speak faster. What happens when you speak really fast? You sound excited. So if you wanna convey excitement, you wanna want speak fairly fast. I don't know if you've ever heard Martin Scorsese, but He's super excited all the time and he speaks really fast a mile a minute and that sort of enthusiasm in his voice always seems to be there, uh, just always comes through. And on the other end, you can slow down. What happens when we speak slower? Well, we start to sound somber and more serious. If you want to tell a sad tale, if you want to get serious for a moment, you will then slow down and not speak quite as fast. So we have the ability to speak uh, uh, speak slower and faster. We can raise the pitch of our voice or lower the pitch. Lower the pitch, uh, speaking lower might make you sound sadder. Speaking, uh, speaking higher might make you sound uh, uh, giddy or in love or something like that. So you can change those kinds of dynamics. You can use different um, uh, speeds. You know, sometimes when you talk, uh, you might want to speak in a monotone all, all the time. But other times when you're telling a story, you might have pauses at the end of phrases or, or uh, read, read things almost in, in paragraphs with, with sentences and commas uh, that you could almost hear and place in the air. And you can certainly have dramatic pauses. So there are things that you can do with your voice to help you convey emotion. And so the second video here is just a run through of those items called the vocal toolbox. And it's just reminding us all of the same thing. So I want you guys to tell a story and I want you to try to use your vocal toolbox. 
Now, am I expecting you guys to be super accomplished at this? No, I'm introducing these concepts for the very first time. We're just trying, we're, we're trying it out. We're getting our feet wet. This is a chance to do this. And maybe, you know, it's the start of something you'll play with for your whole life. But each time you do it, you have a chance to get a little bit better, get a little bit more comfortable with it, try out different techniques. You can start to look at what other people are doing in techniques and so forth. So the instructions for this assignment are the PDF you want to download here, emotional storytelling PDF. And if we download that and read it, you will see that the assignment says, using the vocal toolbox and concepts of hail, tell your audience a story centered around a piece of media that resonates with you. This can be a movie, song, video game, painting, sculpture, or book. The options are endless. Connect with your instructor if you need assistance completing this discussion. So important to note, this week's discussion post is not a piece of writing. It's an audio file. I want you to speak for two to three minutes. Using the storytelling techniques from last week's reading, it's your choice, create a two to three minute audio visual project. So we'll talk about that. I'll show you some examples, but you're creating, you're gonna tell me a story two to three minutes long about a piece of media that had an amazing effect on you. You know, the song you'll always remember because it was uh, playing when you fell in love or a movie that uh, you'll always remember because you had an encounter with someone else. Uh, it has to do with an incident in your life. This isn't just you being a critic and saying, oh, I love this book. The book has a profound impact on you or the media has an impact on you. And the reason that it has an impact is the story that I want you to tell. So if, you know, Final Fantasy VII video game is the one, is the video game that changed your world. I want you to tell me about that. But I don't want you just to tell me about Final Fantasy in itself without you involved. The story that you're telling is why it changed you. What did it, what the impact did it have? What was that encounter? You're telling me a story about yourself and you're transferring this passion. You want to use your voice to tell us what that meant. So this week's initial post is an audio or video file. We're calling it an audio visual project. So I have several examples that I can show you guys. And we have in the listings here, different pieces of software that we re recommend that you can use. You can use PowerPoint, but we don't recommend PowerPoint because PowerPoint doesn't embed into our discussion board. But most of these other choices create files that you can actually just plug in as if it were text. So uh, to make a presentation, we're, we're recommending a tool called Adobe Spark. But to create an audio file, you can do that just using your phone or your computer, make a straight audio file. Or uh, an easy way to do it is to use your webcam or the camera on your phone and just record your face and do a talking headshot and post a video of you speaking. And all of those things can be put in our discussion board. So if you'll uh, go to the discussion board, I've already put several examples in here and I wanna talk about them right now. So the easiest way to do this assignment is to turn on the webcam of your computer or to use your phone, your smartphone, uh, with the, uh, the front facing camera to record yourself and just talk for two to three minutes and tell your story. So uh, the first example here is uh, Andrew talking about the movie Superman. And he's just in his apartment standing in front of his computer. He's got the webcam on and that allows him just to move freely, to use his hands, to use his facial expressions, to be on camera. Now, you don't have to be on camera. This assignment is audio is required, but video is not. But if you're happy to be on video, you can turn on the webcam. And uh, this actual project was, was uploaded to YouTube. So you can see that 
YouTube is embedded in our discussion board. We have a number of tools here. I'm going to show you how to embed media here. But this embeds the super uh, uh, from from YouTube with the YouTube interface. So if I play this, we're going to hear Andy talking oh, about movie. Superman. Uh, that movie was made and was released in 1978. And the first time I actually sat down and watched that movie, uh, I had to have been like five or six years old in that time area. Now, aside from things like great acting performances and casting, amazing technological leaps and bounds and filmmaking, having basically three separate movies in one single movie, aside from those things that I, I would generally say are reasons why it's my favorite movie, the reason that I feel such an emotional connection to it um, goes back to my dad. When I was little, when I was that little, uh, my dad was in the Navy and he was away overseas on deployment for long for really long periods of time and so unfortunately it was during those sort of formative years in my life in my childhood that my dad wasn't there he wasn't around um so i'm sort of lacking that father figure role model i guess i sort of now i have embedded uh these samples in the discussion board they're being available all week so i'll let you watch the whole thing yourself i don't need to spend uh i don't need to show you the entire thing but i'm showing you different types of examples so this is an example of a webcam. Andrew's just standing in front of his computer talking. It's the easiest thing in the world. Now you'll notice that Andy also had clips from the movie. Andy has editing capabilities. He could do this. He not only could create a webcam, but he could then take stills or images from the movie and cut them in. And it, it enhances what he's doing, but it's not required. So if you feel comfortable doing that, feel free to. But don't feel like you have to. Uh, I'm very happy just to get the single webcam shot that you telling your story. So I want everyone to work to the level of techno polish that they're comfortable with. If all of us can just turn on the webcam and speak. So you can just record it if you don't like it, throw it away, record it again. If you get a recording that you like and you want to add slides to it, but you don't know how, Please don't try to do that this week. I just don't want you to be frustrated by it, trying on technical things you don't need to do. I want you to make the best piece that you feel like you can, but I don't want you to be so ambitious this week that you're not really just applying yourself to the important task here, which is to tell a two, three, two to three minute story using your voice. So an easy way to do this is to create a video an easy way to get the video onto the discussion board is to post it to YouTube and cross post it. And I can show you in a minute how to do that. Now, if you want to just do audio, both your phone or your computer can record audio by itself. So you'll have different um, tools that you can use to create audio for uh, um, Macs and PCs. We recommend a software called Audacity. It's a open source software that records audio and is really easy to use. But here's an example of uh, an audio file by itself. Jim's gonna tell us about a Bruce Springsteen song that moved him. And uh, I'm gonna play it for a little bit just to show you that there are lots of different ways to tell these stories. Andrew, when he told his story, he mentions Superman right up front because it, it's important. He's just gonna make those connections. But in order to tell his story, Jim has to do a little bit of setup for us. So let's listen for a second. I remember getting to work a little late that day. I don't remember why I was late. Maybe I had an errand to take care of on the way to work or I was just running behind. My office was on the top floor of a six story building. So I took the elevator up and walked off onto a floor which should have been loud and bustling on a Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. The first thing I noticed though was that it was eerily quiet. And just about everyone was gathered over in the corner staring up at TV monitors that usually showed business news and stock quotes on repeat. I saw one of my friends towards the back of the crowd and I asked him what was going on. I hadn't listened to the radio on the way to work and I hadn't seen the TV that morning at all. He said to me, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center this morning, not looking away from the TV monitor, which I just noticed showed two familiar buildings with black smoke pouring out of them. Even though our so again, I'll let you listen to the entire thing on your own. But um, basically, uh, Jim is going to tell us that uh, he starts off with his memory of 
that. 9-11 is one of those events in uh, modern history that people always know where they were when, it, when they first happened to them. You know, before that, it was uh, uh, John F. Kennedy getting shot. So these are like important milestones. You guys might be of an age where you're a little too young to remember it. You might not have that vivid memory, but uh, anybody who's probably over 25 or 30 probably does have, you know, a very vivid memory of uh, where they were when 9-11 happened and they understood. And that's one of those things we pass along. So uh, Jim is going to talk about a Bruce Springsteen song that he heard about firemen working in the, in the towers. And basically, the very first time he hears it, he has this powerful image or this feeling of deja vu that carries him back to that day. So in order to tell the story, he first sets us up talking about his memory of 9-11. Uh, and that's to show that there are many, many ways to tell a story. Uh, and you guys need to discover the path into your material. And uh, that's gonna be the really interesting, creative, fun part. Uh, you, you might know right away what you wanna talk about, but you might not necessarily know, you know how to tell the story. And you know, there's no right way or wrong way. There's just lots of ways to tell stories. And one of the interesting things is to look at how other people solve those issues. Um, I mentioned that if you wanna use a, a traditional creative presentation type tool, one of the ones we highly recommend is called Adobe Spark. It's an online website made by Adobe. Adobe are the creative uh, uh, company that makes Photoshop and Premiere and Illustrator and lots of other high-end um, um, graphic artist tools. And so they have a website in which uh, you can put together presentations very quickly and easily and efficiently, and it's free. And so we highly recommend it. It's a, a very smart website and it's easy to deal with, uh, but uh, it gives you lots of capabilities. And it also exports an MPEG-4 video that you can then um, embed into the dis discussion board. So I'm gonna show you um, a traditional presentation type of uh, uh, piece that Danielle created about her favorite movie, uh, and she has to explain it a little bit as well. So she's gonna set up uh, why she chose her movie. I think we all can agree that middle school is pretty awkward. It's filled with awkward preteens and their awkward bodies navigating their awkward social cliques. But despite all of that awkwardness, it's in these fragile middle school years that children really begin to piece together who they are and what they care about. It's in middle school where self-esteem seems to be teetering on a tightrope, waiting for a strong gust of wind to push it to one side or the other. And this issue of self-esteem was no different for me. It was in middle school that I realized that I did not fit in with the other girls in my class. I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch never seemed to bother the other girls in my grade. I knew that the things that my peers were turning to was not authentic to me, but I still felt the pressure to conform. I was a tomboy, and in many ways I still am and in middle school that can be difficult to grapple with. I didn't fit into the socially constructed definition of a girl. I never got the guy, I never dressed up, I hate wearing heels. But one thing I did know was that I was in love with the game of basketball. It was in the seventh grade when I first saw what would become my all time favorite movie, Love and Basketball. It was finally a movie for the tomboy. So again, you can see she needs to say who she is before she can reveal her choice. And then it becomes a very natural thing for her to talk about why this movie moved her so much. She's really letting you know who she is, and then you can know why her choice matters to her. Uh, and again, you, you get a good sense of what Adobe Premiere can do. Uh, you know, it runs a little bit like PowerPoint and whatnot. Uh, but another th great thing about uh, Adobe Spark uh, um, is that, uh, I didn't mean to say Premiere, um, Adobe Spark can do, they provide you with, with, with uh, great uh, artwork that you can use as well. You can bring your own artwork in, but they also have uh, uh, motion uh, graphics and um, regular stills that you can use from their libraries, very high quality. So that uh, Adobe Spark gives you an MPEG-4 movie file, 
and we can embed that here and this plays in its own movie interface. So this is a movie that's directly loaded onto the, uh, the full sale uh, uh, discussion board. And I, I put my own entry in here. I have an audio only entry where I'm talking about one of my favorite movies. But even though I do an audio only piece, I can still add audio, add video if I, or add an image if I want. So I chose to take a, a, a movie poster to give you context for the movie that I'm talking about. This is an old classic movie that I like and I, you know, um, I'm telling you a story about it and I'm giving you a little information about it. But uh, you, if you do an audio only piece, you can choose to add an image that will add some context or maybe add your own image, et cetera. If you choose to do um, um, on-camera video, you can do that. If you're working with your camera, I mean, if you're working with your smartphone, you can do vertical video. That uh, tends to work well with the human face. Um, now, uh, one rule if you're using your phone is we want to make sure you lock that phone down. It does not, it's not a good look for you to hold the phone loose in your hand while you're talking. You may think that you're holding it steady, but you probably aren't. So uh, make sure that phone is locked up against something and doesn't move uh, so that it's a clean static shot um, uh, when you're doing that. And um, there are different places that you can use where you can have control of the space to do this. If you're in your own bedroom and, you, and nobody else is there, that's certainly a fine place to do it. Uh, sometimes people don't have access to that space at home. Uh, you know, one place where people do control space Oddly, is your car. So I'm not recommending anybody record this while they're driving, but while you're parked, you can be in your car in control of that audio space. And certainly if you wanted to make a uh, uh, smartphone camera uh, shot, you could lock the uh, phone against the steering wheel and that it would uh, perfectly keep it in place while you talked and it would be about the appropriate distance you want to make sure that that phone is about 12 to 15 inches away from your face and you speak loudly and the microphone should capture the audio really well. So if, uh, uh, and then you can transfer it from the audio, uh, you can transfer it from your phone to your computer or directly to the FSO website. And as I mentioned up here in the post, you want to introduce your post, but then there are a number of tools here where you can embed uh, if you're embedding audio, it wants to be MP, MPEG-3 audio. If you end up having the, the newer MPEG-4 audio, you just drag it down here as an attachment and that'll still play, but it won't play in the cool little player that is embedded. MPEG-3 audio will embed as a player. MPEG-4 audio video will again uh, load up and play in its own interface. The if you're shooting a uh, video or you're creating it, uh, you want to make sure that the video is under 500 megabytes. That's the limit to uploading uh, giant files to our discussion board. And if you put that, uh, you, you can have a single image like I did, uh, or the, there's this embed tool. This embed tool allows you to cross link from other websites. So a great way to handle video is to put it on YouTube and use the embed link from YouTube, to just put the code in here. Um, and this embed tag captures from InDesign, from Spark, from Google uh, Documents, uh, um, SoundCloud, uh, YouTube, Zoom, Spotify, Vimeo, uh, VoiceThread, a lot of places here, uh, Office 365. So if you create uh, a file on another website, you can embed and cross, uh, cross post it here. And anybody that's having trouble linking their video in, I'll be around and I can help people uh, get their video posted looking nice. But this creates a really fun looking discussion board where people can play the, your file directly within. Again, if you wanted to do something like PowerPoint, uh, the worst that would happen is that you would put it in drop and drag people would download it, watch your video, all, watch your PowerPoint offline, and then come back and, and, and respond. Uh, we want you to um, try to get your first post up by Friday. So we're going to give you most of this week to get that done. And then for the uh, 
since since there's a two whole weeks that this uh, week two activity is going to be available, you'll have the rest of that time to respond to other people. You will have an act. You'll have two people that you have to respond to. Um, if if we look at the uh, instructions here, you have to have an initial post, which in this case is your audiovisual project. It's two minute, two to three minutes long. It has to be audio. It can be video if you want. Uh, and then you also have two replies due by the end of next week. And so once everybody gets their emotional stories in place, you should come back and, and interact with everyone. There should be lots to discuss here. You can talk to someone about how well they use their vocal toolbox, or you can talk to them about their choices of media. Uh, if, if someone you know, uh, likes Harry Potter and you like Harry Potter, you can, you can talk about that. So you know, the choice of subject matter, uh, media choices uh, 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 work as well. And on those of you that are here studying sports casting, um, it's certainly uh, a legitimate to talk about the favorite game that you, you always watch, watched, you know, game six of the World Series or something like that, and to talk about that as an emotional experience. So um, uh, that works in, in the same regard, uh, talking about something that you have a passion for. What we don't want you to hear, what we don't want to hear is you talking about your own artwork. Where this, this, is, this is external media that you are uh, inspired by. So we don't want you uh, saying, oh, I'm inspired by myself. That's a form of self-promotion. This is passing on your passion for other people's work. And that's a, a particular kind of vocal uh, expression. And I think that it, it's going to be very fun. Uh, you need to, you know, look at all the different parts, make sure you're, you know, you're following the instructions, but uh, this should be something that's really challenging and really fun for you guys to do. So finally, we get to this week's activity, which is creating the plan for the um, presentation for the month. And I have never yet told you what the, the presentation is. So this is the point where we talk about what this presentation that we're working on for the rest of the month is. And that is that you are going to imagine that you have graduated all the way through full sale. This is that you're projecting yourself into the future and that you've gained all the skills that you came here to learn, that you've done project to portfolio work and worked on group projects and and has a, have a great resume and I want you to know I want you to think about what company you've always wanted to work for who is your dream employer did you always want to work for Pixar or uh, Apple or Google or Netflix Universal Studios whoever in your industry is the company that you re really want to work for and this may take some research on your part. Maybe you've never thought about this before. Maybe you're looking to do some media work in your own area and you don't want to move and you don't know who's in your area. Well, this is a week in which you can do some research. So maybe you want to become an audio producer and you live in Omaha and you don't know what audio studios there are in Omaha. This is the time to find out because if that's the dream job you want to have, then you have to figure out how you're going to, who are they and, 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 and uh, what do you know about them? We want you to do research on your target audience. Each one of you are going to have a different target audience. The target audience is the company that you want to hire you. You're going to do a three to four minute presentation about yourself and your skills. Basically what we call your brand. What are the uh, skills that you have to apply to your profession. And you have three to four minutes unfettered to talk to those folks, tell them who you are, tell them what your passion is, how you gain that passion, what skills you have, how you gain those skills, what your artistic vision is, what you think of their company, and how you might fit in their company. That's what the presentation I want you to create is. 
And this is not a presentation that you're doing for today. This is projecting into the future. So the person who's speaking to this dream audience is not the you of today that doesn't yet know all of, of the programming, uh, hasn't really worked with the cameras and yet, or done all of the uh, audio processing. This is, this is you having graduated. Everything you came here to full sail, to study, you've learned. And I want you to own that. And I want you to speak with confidence to that employer and tell them what it is you have to do, have, uh, have to offer them. And I want you to seek that job. You're gonna tell them a story. The story is who you are. The story has a beginning, middle and end. So in your plan that you're going to give me at the end of two weeks, Sunday the 20th, uh, you're going to identify your target audience. Tell me what company you want to work for. Tell me what you know about them. Tell me how you plan to um, um, address them and so forth. You need to do research on this company so that you know who they are. You want to talk about what is your big idea, meaning what is your brand? What is the specialty? What are the skills and services that you have to offer that is special? You're a great creative writer. You're a great director. You're a great graphic designer. Uh, you're a great programmer. Let us know. And you want to tell us that in a story that has a beginning, middle, and end. And so the beginning of your story is, how did you get interested in your current topic? What got you interested in music? What got you interested in, in, in web programming? What got you interested in movie making? So you're going to tell us you know, video game planning, design. You know, I played my Nintendo when I was seven and I figured out how to uh, create my own game. What is your origin of your passion? I want, to, I want you to tell me the beginning. I want you to lay that out. I want you to tell us where your passion comes from. Middle, what could be? This is where you talk about acquiring your skills and this is gonna involve full sale. It won't involve full sale only. Maybe some of you were in the army. Maybe some of you worked for 10 years in the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the marketing trade. And you, you realize now that you want to be running your own uh, social media marketing company. The life skills that you've had, the experience that you've had, all becomes part of who you are. And so that's part of the story that you want to tell. But in terms of your time here at Full Sail, you want to speak about it in the past tense. And I want you to pick one or two classes and, and, and uh, uh, bring, uh, bring them up and talk about what you learned from them. If you do not know what classes you're going to take yet, that's part of the research that you have to do. If you look in the announcements today, you'll see that I have a short video here that tells you how each one of you can find your own um, uh, degree program. Now I have the college website up right now. I'm here on the main college page and it breaks into all these degrees. Somebody in the chat box, type a degree program that you, you want me to look up. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do this right now. And it's also in the video that's in the announcements. But somebody just, uh, games, okay. So if I choose games, I have undergraduate and graduate programs. I'm gonna assume an undergraduate uh, game design bachelors. And when I do that, I have the ability to look at the, my entire schedule, course schedule right here, online. So if I want to be an online bachelors, it takes 29 months. And you can see the very first class you're taking is creative presentation. The next one is called psychology of play. And they have every single class that you're going to take for the next 29 months here listed. So you have a chance to look through your schedule and you can decide. Uh, I don't want you to just list 15 classes. I want you to pick one or two classes and talk about how that had an influence on you. And that also means that as you go through here, you're going to be creating portfolio work. You know, if you go through the game design uh, program, you're going to work in a team on creating a game, a, a, a prototype game. You might want to talk about that. You might want to talk about the game that you created. And again, you don't have to create the game itself, but you have to talk about it as if you did. 
So you're going to be able to like borrow art from the internet to, to represent work that you created, but you need to talk about this stuff and represent it as part of whom you are. So everyone should figure out what your game, what your course schedule is. Look through your classes, make sure you're, you're clear about that. Um, and uh, coming back to the instructions here, uh, the end, the call to action. At the end of our presentation, you want to stand in front of your company and say, these are the skills that I have. These are the values your company believes in. I believe we're a good fit. I want to join your team. I want you to hire me. I need you to stand and make that ask. That's an important part of the visualization you're going through. Now, the reason we're asking you to do this is that it will help you in the long run for whatever degree program you're here to go through to have a visualization of the person that you want to become. You're stepping into those shoes. And you're imagining that you've become that person. What did it take to get there? And so I don't want you to be, you know, pie in the sky fanciful. I want you to be serious and truthful about how much you can accomplish, what skills you're going to have, how well you're going to be able to apply those skills to other places. Some of you may decide that you need to work at a couple of other jobs before you go for your dream job. You know, that straight out of college, maybe you're not ready. Maybe you're going to work at, at one or two other companies and then you will apply. That's fine. Think about the path that you want to go on and you lay it out here. Uh, and what might a star moment be? What might be some elements that you create in your presentation that give your dream audience a sense of who you are and what you're capable of? This is a written document. This is not the presentation itself. Remember, this is the week of planning. This is the week of brainstorming. I want you to take all of these things that are required and I want you to stew on them. I want you to come up with ideas. I want lots of elements here for, you know, what is your story in the beginning, middle and end? And I want you to have all of those elements on paper and turn them into me. And that's due on Sunday the 20th. Now, uh, last week I offered you some samples. This week I have some samples as well. So uh, there are a number of different ways that you can put your brainstorming together. There's no set format that you have to do. Sometimes people use a Word doc and they put things in outline format. So you can just have lots of bullet points. But remember, all of these headers have to be represented. You know, as we come here, target audience, big idea, star moment, beginning, middle, and end. Now we have flow of ideas. Flow of ideas actually equals beginning, middle, and end. So, you know, those are a little bit redundant there. But each of the plans that you guys turn into me have to include these elements. So sometimes people write out things in paragraph form. It just depends on how you think. If you want to put your ideas together and, and, and just write it as a paragraph, that's fine. And how much should you have? Well, I can't tell you for sure, but in terms of bullet point items, I want to see multiple per category. Uh, and again, some people go on longer than others. Some people might want to add visuals in here. I don't necessarily need to see visuals. Uh, some people, you know, it, it helps them to go ahead and gather some imagery. That's good. You can put it in there. You don't have to. What I, what I need are target audience, beginning, middle, and end. And different people think of things in different ways. Here's a person who did it as post-it notes on a wall. So once he got all of his elements put together, and believe me, all the elements are here. Here's the beginning, middle, and end. Here's his audience. Here's his uh, star moment. So he's thought all these things through. And it's kind of silly or humorous, but this is the way he works. So he was able to put this on the wall, and then he took a picture of it and turned it in. I'm happy to accept this as your plan. Now, here's the, uh, here's the rub. I have to be able to read your writing. If you want to give me pages out of your notebook, if you want to give me something that's handwritten, 
make sure I can write it. And the rule of thumb is, if you think maybe I can't write it, maybe if you think maybe I can't read your writing, definitely I can't read your writing. If I can't read your writing, you have to type it up. You have to go into the computer and put it together on a computer. For most of you, it might be simpler to do it on a computer. And there are lots of tools to work with on computers as well. Um, people who want to work visually, want to work outside of using uh, something like Microsoft Word, there are tools called mind maps that allow you to do the same kind of outlines. Uh, this is really the same as a Microsoft outline. You know, here's, here's the header planning presentation. Here's the big idea, you know, the, uh, the, um, the brand. Here's the company, here's his target audience. He wants to work for Bethesda. And these are elements about Bethesda. This is the research he's done on this company. And we have the beginning, middle, and end. These are all the parts of his story that he's gonna tell me. So these could have been um, a word outline, but this person likes to work visually, he used a mind mapping tool. Uh, I'm gonna uh, put some notes up to show you, you know, what mind mapping tools there are available if you think this is an interesting way to work. Uh, but uh, it just depends on who you are, how you wanna work. I think most people would like to work in Word or some document and just be able to put in uh, lists and you know uh, separate points. And so if you work in an outline format, you don't have to have complete sentences, you just have elements. If you wanna write complete sentences, if you wanna write paragraphs, this is fine. So I have, again, like I say, a number of, this person's a mobile developer, it's giving me his target audience, his future self, his true message, beginning, middle, and end. So all the elements that I'm asking for, uh, as long as you address them, uh, I, I'm, I'm very open-minded to the format you wanna use. And so, as you guys start to work on this or think about this, and you want to look at some examples or review some examples, you know, just get a hold of me and I will have them available. Um, here's, here's someone who wants to be a graphic designer for Disney. So she decided to make that the plan that she turned in part of her resume. You know, you can tell this is something from a graphic designer. It has graphic elements in it and it's well very clean and well laid out. So, you know, you can you can work in a way that makes the most sense for you. So uh, do we have any questions? Anybody that wants to ask a question, just raise your hand. You know, click on the, uh, the hand, I'll, I'll unmute your mic, or you can type a question in the uh, um, uh, chat box. What are the five rules again uh, on brainstorming? Uh, don't stop after after the beginning. Encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. Quantity counts more than quality at, at the beginning. And uh, build on rules, build on ideas built up by others. And everybody's ideas count. No questions. All right, well, you guys are going to need some help at some point. Uh, again, there's plenty of time this week. You, you're gonna be able to take advantage of the, the extra week that got built in. Um, and uh, so uh, the first thing to do is probably attack the reading and then work on your um, emotional story. You all wanna try to get that posted by Friday. And then you'll have a whole other week to work on your plan. Those of you that really have a sense of what you wanna do, uh, this plan makes sense if this idea for the topic, again, the topic is you're presenting yourself, your brand, your skills to your dream audience in three to four minutes. Uh, so if you wanna go ahead and uh, get started on that earlier, all you need to do is turn in the plan before it's due and let me know and I will grade it and give you comments and uh, if your plan looks good, I'll just say, hey, go ahead, start working on the final. But don't, don't start working on the final until you give me the plan. And uh, I know some of you haven't worked with a plan before and it's unusual, it's, it's not a normal way to work. Well, just try it out, give it a shot. Uh, I, I agree, I, I, I think it's going to be a, 
a way that makes you work better and faster, even though it seems like more work than you're used to doing. You usually never think about these things and then that means that you've forgotten part of it. And writing it down means you have to address all the elements. And that's really the best part of it. It's almost like a checklist. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna let you guys go. I know I've spoken for quite a while, but I've recorded it all. You can come back and watch the video and you can ask me questions all through the week. So um, everything's cool, but this is a really the chance for you guys to be creative. You can be creative in the stories. You, re you can really get to start thinking about the company that you wanna work for and the job that you wanna do in the future. All right, good night everybody, thanks.